at the Battle of Borodino. A bayoneted Russian cavalryman, bewildered in the fog and the smoke of battle, collapses in the sludge along a riverbank. History is chaos. 150 years later, at the Sandhurst Military Academy, a professor and his students analyzed that battle. The cavalry did this, the infantry that, the topography, weaponry, weather, and so on. They map the geography of the battle. History is conceptual. Tolstoy's conclusion, history would be an excellent thing if only it were true. Ed Soja applies the Tolstoy dialectic to the study of cities. One geography or multiple geographies. A single map or innumerable maps. The city experience one citizen at a time or the city collective amenable to, to empirical analysis. The hackneyed phrase tells us what you see is what you get. Ed Soja tells us what you get in the city is contingent on what you don't see. Ed Soja maps a city's geography and perhaps the city's geography becomes the geography he maps. Soja delivers an urban exegesis, origins, transitions, permutations, or causes and effect, or sociology and economics, or genuine and disingenuous, or characters, or institutions. No canned allegiances, ideologies, caricatured villains, or heroes. How's that? Preview. Ed Soja explains the past to the present and foreshadows the future. Is one city every city? Is there an a priori pattern of urban evolution and decline? Does the city belong to its own exigencies or do the city's causes precede the city itself? There are two prototypical urban stories. One is simply to extricate an urban narrative, cause and effect, constituent parts, and destination. But what destination? That's option two. Can we manipulate the causes to reformulate the effects to imagine a new and different city? Does Ed Soja chronicle urban history, or is he an aspiring city architect speculating on the next metropolis? Which brings us to Los Angeles. Does the Soja exegesis anticipate a future city, not entirely obligated to the intersection of the past and the present, that obviates precedent to create new precedents? And is Los Angeles that urban surprise? Ed Soja will tell us. Please welcome Ed Soja to SciArc. Thank you. I have to. Uh, lots of things go back so that we don't have too much of a preview. No, the wrong. No, excuse me. I'm not very good with visuals. Uh, I'm doing this exclusively for an architectural audience. This is my, only my second PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I usually, when I talk to architects, I usually tell a story about when I first started teaching uh, at UCLA. I co-taught a course on urban morphology with uh, an architect professor. 
Uh, and uh, he started by telling the architectural st architecture students that uh, he's a specialist in visuals and he has uh, 4,000 slides and he's going to use uh, visuals in uh, every aspect of his presentations. And then I was just starting out here and I said, oh, well, my goodness. Uh, and I came uh, on and, and uh, said, well, I'm a specialist in verbals rather than visuals. And I swear one of the architecture students turned to the other and said, what do they look like? <laughs> uh, and so uh, I, I, I usually talk my presentations, but I am going to be a little extra visual tonight uh, with the um, PowerPoint presentation. Well, my topic is, is literally uh, there, uh, putting cities first. And I'm basically going to spend uh, the, the next, whatever, 45 minutes, hour, uh, explaining what I mean by that phrase and trying to make it much more demanding uh, and I think exciting uh, than it may appear at first. Uh, I might mention Los Angeles, but the lecture is not going to be particularly on Los Angeles. The title, first of all, uh, is borrowed from a first chapter uh, of an extraordinary book that has been revived in extraordinary ways these days, a book written by Jane Jacobs in published in 1969, called The Economy of Cities, a book that was swamped by the fame of her earlier book on the death and life of great American cities, which architects and planners read all the time. Uh, but her major achievement uh, in her, I would argue, her career uh, was concentrated most effectively in this book uh, called The Economy of Cities, uh, in which, as I say, the first chapter is putting cities first. Uh, that had a very particular meaning in the book. It had to do with the origins of cities, and I'll come, actually come back to that later on. Uh, but uh, it also is related to another dimension uh, of what I mean by putting, putting cities first. Uh, the, there's probably no uh, other time in history when doing urban analysis or studying cities uh, has been so important, so widespread, and so exciting, I, I go back to that word, that there have been many new discoveries about what cities do to our lives and what they have done throughout history uh, that have been developed in very recent years uh, that are uh, creating a, an urban revolution, if you want, of sorts. Uh, so putting cities first has multi multiple levels to it. Yeah? Uh, one level is a straightforward statistical one that almost everybody, every urbanist today starts the lectures with. Uh, and, and that is uh, the statistical fact that in 2006 the United Nations officially announced that the majority of the world's population now lives in cities. This has been uh, used by urban scholars repeatedly to uh, talk about a new urban age that we've entered. Uh, and it is one of the aspects that uh, I am uh, attaching to this notion of putting cities first, uh, that for the first time in history, although this probably occurred earlier, it has to do with the statistical methods used by the United Nations, uh, that this calculus has occurred this time, in 2006. Uh, but uh, basically what has been happening recently has been the emergence of a predominantly urban world population. And by the way, the vast majority of this urban population uh, lives in a uh, huge, well, not so huge, I mean, the, in terms of the Earth's surface, but lives in uh, large metropolitan, what we call now city regions of more than a million people. Um, I, I used to interpret the United Nations saying that the majority now lives in these million plus city regions, but actually that's not 3.3 billion, but it's getting close to that. So first, is, there's, there's this 
recognition that, that the world is now more urban than ever before, and certainly now we have more city people than non-city people living on the face of the earth, and that this means something. But what I'm talking about again in putting cities first, uh, as I say, more demanding, uh, and, and with, with a more exciting payoff, uh, has to do with how one interprets the world and interprets history. Thanks, uh, Eric, for making some connections between my work and, and history. I, I actually know uh, the bass part to a complex singing of the song Borodino uh, that I, I used to sing as part of a choral group that I was part of, but I don't think I'll sing about Borodino, although that's an interesting, interesting piece. Um, that we're, we're getting, and again we could come back to Jane Jacobs, uh, an argument that cities, or what I call urban spatial causality, you know, blunt words, cities cause huge things to happen in ways that we've not seen for uh, ever. Huh? We're only opening up our vision to the power and the generative effect of cities uh, in the last 10 years. So my starting points, two starting points. One, a statement from Jane Jacobs. A statement which you could have read years ago or even now and say, oh, that's interesting. Uh, but it's one of the most powerful statements around uh, and is really at the heart of uh, Jane Jacobs's uh, writings in the economy of cities and, and subsequently. Uh, summarized around the statement, without cities we would all be poor. There would not have been any societal development. What she is basically arguing is that we would have remained what we were for 99.9% .9 of the history of the human species and that is hunters and gatherers and fisher folk uh, who lived in uh, bands, uh, loose bands uh, of uh, people of about 60 to 75, maybe 100, in some very rare cases 150, uh, dependent entirely upon nature, nomadic, unsettled, no cities, no settlements. Uh, we would have remained at su as such uh, and uh, until uh, cities formed. Right? Uh, and the story then begins with the formation of cities. Now this deep historical argument is not necessarily one that has been central to what's discussed today, but there is a connection between this 12,000-year-old argument about cities originating societal development uh, and some of the discussions about cities today, the contemporary city, uh, as a center for generating creativity, aesthetic creativity, technological innovation, and all forms of economic and social development. Cities are the mother of economic development, she says, not because people are smarter in cities, but because of the conditions of one of the areas of her interests, uh, the notion of sort of heterogeneous density. Uh, density is a very key area for her in all of her writings, including the Greenwich Village uh, romantic writings about uh, Manhattan before she left. By the way, she wrote The Economy of Cities when she escaped Manhattan uh, because of the draft uh, in uh, 1969 in the Vietnam War and went to Canada where she stayed the rest of her life until she died last year. There is a concentration of need in cities and a greater incentive to address problems in ways that haven't been addressed before. That is to try something new, uh, to innovate, to do something different. There's something about the proximity, the kind of thickness of social interaction that comes from living together in a single agglomeration or cluster or lots of other words being used today. Without that, we'd all be poor. So that's the starting point of the most uh, urgent, demanding, uh, and I think exciting 
uh, understanding and meaning of the notion of putting cities first. All right, well, it moves rapidly. Now I understand why it flipped around. You just can't even go near it, it works. Um, this is a second, another second inspiration for me. Uh, Henri Lefebvre, who I've always been using in, in all my writings for many, many years. Uh, and he made a sort of similar statement. He said, the development of society is conceivable only in urban life through the realization of urban society. So he's sort of saying the same thing, that from the beginning, all society, all societies were fundamentally urban societies saying the same thing in a way for the last 12,000 years. All social life has been fundamentally influenced by urban. This doesn't mean everybody lived in cities uh, or what we thought of as cities, but that they were being influenced by the ideas and forces for good and bad that emanates uh, and emanated from cities. Uh, this is uh, an elaboration, a more theoretical argument that's included here too. Uh, we used to, in the past, think of cities as sort of epiphenomena uh, in Western social thought, political theory, and so on. Uh, the city had no causal power in Western social theory. Uh, it was sort of reduced to a partial phenomenon, to a secondary, elementary, accidental background container of, of activities, uh, environment, um, happening to uh, impinge upon the dominant forces of history. History was the shaping force. Uh, and that history had people, it had all kinds of things, but cities were not shaping forces. Only now uh, we're beginning to grasp the specificity of the city. So very quickly, uh, putting cities first is more than just a statistical fact. It foregrounds the stimulus and power of urban agglomeration, represents a radical shift in Western social thought, uh, reflects and builds upon a broader spatial turn, which I have been writing and talking about for a number of years, uh, that uh, the urban uh, emphasis has, has piggybacked upon uh, an extraordinary phenomenon, uh, and that has been the diffusion of spatial thinking from the old spatial disciplines, your discipline of architecture, my background discipline of geography, being uh, the two key uh, old spatial disciplines, where space mattered from the beginning, uh, always in the discipline. Uh, but now, space matters in a whole range of other disciplines. Again, I'll come back to this. And then the excitement comes from the fact that putting cities first is opening up radical new ideas that are changing the canons and thoughts of uh, Western philosophy uh, and uh, social science uh, and humanities in general. Cities, quickly, are, are both magnets attracting populations and activities, but also motors, driving forces, are generative forces, creativity, innovation, development, uh, ignored in Western traditions, I've been saying, we're only now beginning to put cities first, recognizing urbanization as a primary force in human history and societal development, uh, and again, the argument that uh, by putting space, putting urban spatial causality first and exploring it, uh, we're going to make theoretical revisions and breakthroughs in almost every kind of discipline, uh, ending up with the kind of summary that would make no sense 20 years ago, but is beginning to make extraordinary sense today. Every form of scholarship, we must all be urbanists uh, today. So what I'm going to do actually today is uh, uh, from this excitement, it's really nice to get old and still remain excited about your subject area. And I guess uh, uh, as an urban and regional scholar, I don't think I've ever been uh, as excited by the potential new ideas emerging from this kind of approach as I am today. Uh, and so uh, partly inspired by both Lefebvre and um, Jane Jacobs, both of whom lived into their 90s, vital, 
uh, Lefebvre in particular published, I think, 35 books after he retired. Uh, and so in the spirit uh, of, of a very personal uh, reaction to that, I'm going to talk about 10 books that I hope to complete before I die, uh, and uh, in the spirit of perhaps uh, uh, living to the ripe old ages of, of uh, Jacobs and Lefebvre. Uh, I'm also using this as an invitation for those of you who are interested to join in the process of producing these books, because I probably am not going to be able to finish all of them. Uh, so uh, that is uh, what I'm planning to do. Uh, I actually had a dozen or more, but I, I reduced it to ten for tonight. Uh, and uh, I will discuss them uh, briefly as we go on. Okay, the first book uh, I describe is The Great Ontological Distortion. Uh, this is something I've been uh, writing about and talking about and has uh, directly relates to uh, Eric's introductory remarks about the complex relationship between history and geography, between time and space. And I've been arguing that until recently, until even the last 15, 20 years, oh, please, 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 I hate that. I usually am not aggressive, but I hate telephones, you know, cell phones in the audience. Um, that uh, what I've argued is that until very recently, uh, all of Western social thought uh, had been dominated by what I'm calling historicism, a kind of primacy of history. Uh, a privileging of historical knowledge and analysis over geographical knowledge and analysis. It still lingers today. We have this tremendous respect for the historian. Uh, and only recently I were beginning to even recognize the geographer as a scholar uh, of any substance. Uh, architecture has its own deeper historical and romantic tradition that keeps uh, it at a relatively high level, uh, status level, but geography has been, in particularly in the United States, extraordinarily peripheralized. Uh, I can tell stories about my academic career and teaching in a department in Northwestern University where the chair once said uh, he has to deal every day with irate parents who call him up and scream at him because he's like the Reverend Moon. He, we, he, we influence their children to become geography majors uh, when they should be doctors or lawyers or whatever. How dare you take my, my child away and, 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 and give them a cult or something by, by putting them into geography? I didn't even know geography was taught at the university, the parents would say. Well, uh, so I've been uh, writing about this process of privileging time and subordinating space, uh, and certainly distancing Western theory and practice from the issue and the force of urban causality. Uh, I go on here and talk about why I call this an ontological distortion. This was a deep, deep distortion in Western thought. It, was, uh, it had to do with the way in which and we've been learning based upon this ever since, uh, what the world is like, what, what being in the world uh, is about. Uh, and it's about time. Zeit und Sein, the famous book by one of the most influential ontologist, uh, Heidegger, who I know architects have some interest in in terms of dwelling and other kinds of things. Uh, but he was, uh, he wrote, a, a, his most influential book uh, was on Zeit und Sein, and I put ohne Raum, the Raum was left out, uh, although he himself did seriously look at space, uh, his space as important as time, uh, but basically uh, ended up by saying, I don't think so, and, and went out, and the influence was uh, to uh, Forget about space, in a sense, and, and focus upon temporality. <clears throat> One of the interesting uh, play, plays on that is that we have no problem with the concept of zeitgeist, you know, the spirit of the times. Uh, but what's happening now, sometimes it's described as raumgeist, 
the spatial spirit of the moment, uh, and that sort of relates uh, to some of the kinds of things I'm arguing. Uh, I say uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this, just to mention that uh, until recently, until the recent spatial turn, uh, one of the only examples of uh, uh, an exceptional, an exception to this uh, rule was the Chicago School of Urban Ecology, uh, which actually asserted the power of spatial causality in a clumsy and primitive and, and problematic way in many ways, uh, but it was the only uh, major moment against the tide of historicism. So this is book one. I've written part of it before, uh, but it needs to be repeated and asserted again because uh, it still is one of the major barriers uh, to uh, putting cities first uh, and recognizing the power of cities uh, and the effects of cities on our lives. Parisian Reversals, it's book two. Uh, this focuses upon an early attempt to reassert the importance of space uh, that seemed unusually concentrated in Paris. I've been trying to convince students, particularly historians, because I don't really have the time to dig this deeply into history uh, uh, in my work, uh, to, to, to sort of spend time. There should be many, many books written on this unusual combination of Henri Lefebvre's work and Michel Foucault's work in Paris in the 60s and the early 70s. An extraordinary uh, um, concurrence uh, of ideas, even with wonderful questions about who stole from whom or who influenced who more uh, in this. I have my ideas. Lefebvre was much more of a magpie and he stole from everyone. Foucault was much more private, so probably it was uh, that way around. But nevertheless, there's a rich history to be written here. Uh, a, a traditional kind of, of intellectual history because they together were producing the most radical rethinking of spatial approaches, perspectives, uh, that had happened anywhere. There are other examples. I know many of you might have some favorite people, Bakhtin or whatever, uh, um, Benjamin, uh, but I, I think Lefebvre and Foucault uh, came up with some of the most uh, important and interesting new ideas, uh, particularly uh, not dismissing history, but criticizing history, occluding or, or subordinating spatial thinking. And the argument that the spatial and the historical uh, are equivalent in their power. One should never be privileged over the other. Uh, and that together they provide uh, an argument similar to, uh, an argument that makes us understand the very nature of society and societal development. Uh, so this triple dialectic, uh, as Lefebvre called it, between the historicality of social life, the sociality of social life, of human life, and the spatiality of human life. A three-sided relationship in which no one is privileged over the other, uh, at least a priori. I mean, one can do more of an historical analysis, more of a social analysis of any particular topic. Uh, but what I'm writing about is, is that uh, we, we mustn't continue to privilege the social uh, and sociality and historicality over spatiality. And the, the, the major force for this argument came from the work of Lefebvre and Foucault, on which I can spend uh, also a lot of time uh, and space, I guess. Uh, the modernist blockades. Uh, what I mean by this is that although very much related to what was happening to cities in the 60s, the explosion of, of, of uh, conflict and unrest in cities all over the world, the crisis of urbanism, the urban crisis, uh, particularly May 68 in Paris, which was based on Fevre's ideas in, in many, many specific ways, uh, that uh, the ideas that they, took pl that, that they created in response to the 60s because much of the writing was taking place in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, was almost impossible to understand in ways that were almost exactly like Jane Jacobs' book in 1969. That trio were making radical breakthroughs about urban spatial causality 
in the late 60s, early 70s, responding to the fact that these crises, these urban crises, exposed architecture, planning, uh, geography, and urban studies as uh, n totally inadequate to the task of understanding why cities were erupting, why cities were, were, were exploding in the 60s. Uh, and uh, there was almost no one else that could understand what they were saying. Uh, Jane Jacobs was ridiculed for her arguments. Uh, similarly, uh, even his closest Marxist colleagues, uh, recognizing the Fevre's brilliant urban observations, said, oh, he's going much too far. Uh, and he got called what I got called, uh, writing uh, a little bit later, uh, a spatial fetishist, right? That I was fetishizing space and using it to explain everything. Eh? Uh, okay, so that's a story that I, I, I'd also like to tell in book two. Uh, and that means that for about 20 to 25 years, the impact of the Fevre and Foucault's thinking about space was muted, uh, almost ignored. Uh, geographers and, and architects and architectural theorists uh, when they did recognize, and they did a lot, Lefebvre and uh, Foucault, uh, it was uh, uh, almost always using both of them to reinforce their own ways of thinking about space, their traditional ways of thinking about space, when at the core of what they were saying was that all of you uh, in your traditional spatial, not only those who don't think spatially should, but the think, people who think spatially need to think spatially in a different way. This was completely unseen and misunderstood until maybe, I, 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 rough date, mid-90s perhaps, uh, when a, a new kind of debate took place and we saw this transdisciplinary diffusion taking place, particularly in the humanities. Disciplines like, uh, I mean, I, 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 the list of disciplines I, I sort of include that I've been uh, lecturing to I lecture re more and more rarely to geographers uh, and planners, and to some extent also a little bit less uh, to architects, but architects are at least keeping their interest alive more than I think geographers are. Uh, but uh, giving lectures to comparative literature conferences, uh, to conferences on rhetoric, rhetoric uh, on art practice. Art has been experiencing an urban spatial turn that's much stronger than architecture than anything that's been happening in architecture. Artists today are knowing this larger urban, regional, spatial literature, uh, much more so than uh, architects and, and, and most geographers as well. Uh, you've seen a kind of, as I say, transdisciplinary diffusion of a critical, of a spatial perspective, thin in some areas, but getting deeper and deeper in a lot of others. Uh, and you see associated with this, this resurgence of interest in cities and regions. Uh, the examples I include here, uh, just the A's and the E's and a few others, uh, anthropology, art criticism and practice, art history, archaeology and accounting. I got a letter from, an uh, email from a lecture uh, in Edinburgh in Scotland about eight years ago. And he said that, oh, you know, I read your work and Lefebvre and Foucault and I just realized my whole discipline has been completely revolving around historicism and I'm going to engage in a total spatial transformation of the theoretical foundations of my discipline and his discipline was accounting, right? The most recent thing, I, I list eth uh, economics, ethnomusicology, educational psychology, ethics and eschatology. I'm apparently much hotter than I should be and want to be in theological circles. Uh, I recently lectured in Manchester on a conference on God's space in the city. Uh, and biblical scholars are using me. And then at these conferences, I, uh, extraordinary, uh, people presenting their papers on, on, on my work, uh, and particularly hot, apparently, in eschatology. Uh, which, uh, as I understand it, is a kind of a discourse on heaven and hell and on the end of life and so on, what happens. Uh, and it turns out that they found my notions of third space, you know, three interactive ways of interpreting all spaces, you know, those words like heterotopia and so on, 
that architects and others use, uh, was very useful for discussing heaven and hell. That heaven and hell had these three spatial dimensions to them. And so eschatologists were, were following soja uh, in, in ways that were extraordinary. So these are sort of these really weird outer limits of the spatial turn. Uh, but just to sort of uh, uh, experiment with this, there was the first international conference that I've been to on the spatial turn held in a tiny university city in Germany. Uh, and led by people in the media and communications department where the spatial turn has also been unusually intense. Uh, in many ways, these outer disciplines, these formerly not spatial disciplines, are doing more exciting work than the inner disciplines of geography, architecture, and planning. Uh, that uh, the old spatial disciplines, many of which are saying, what spatial turn? We've always done spatial analysis. What's all this fuss about the spatial turn? These people are just doing peripheral stuff out there. And maybe at first that was okay. Uh, but these are doing new kinds of spatial stuff. Putting space first, putting city causality first as an interpretive frame. Uh, even geographers and architects don't do this very often, uh, and urban and regional planners. Uh, so, uh, this is a, a book that I've already started writing in, in pieces uh, on the spatial turn. Uh, here is a, a, a kind of going back to remember dear Jane Jacobs. This would be a, the city in geohistory. Uh, the city in history, of course, is the name of a famous book by Lewis Mumford. Uh, and in order to understand Jane Jacobs' work in 1969, you have to understand her relationship and, and symbolically and physically and other ways uh, with regard to Mumford. Mumford had published in the early 60s The City in History and had become world, recognized worldwide as the expert on the history of cities. Right? Uh, this cranky, anti-urban, uh, regional environmentalist, uh, Lewis Mumford, uh, was recognized as the great thinker about cities. Uh, when he was really not interested in big cities and not interested in density uh, in comparison to, to, to Jane Jacobs. Uh, and so there were these grand debates. I mean, uh, Mumford wrote that he really liked the dispersed and almost invisible cities of Egypt versus the centralized uh, city-states of Sumeria. Uh, and he uh, argued that uh, centralization in the city, agglomeration, meant despotism. Right? And actually the free and dispersed rural kind of city uh, of, of ancient Egypt uh, was much more preferable. Uh, but both were agreeing, well, we, the we have always been urban goes back to the uh, other uh, argument I meant. Uh, but the putting cities first was the first chapter of the economy of cities, Jacobs, uh, in which she made an argument. The one thing that she had in her uh, research pot that uh, Mumford didn't was a peculiar research by a, a rather wild and wonderful architect in uh, southern uh, Turkey, uh, a, a British architect, uh, archaeologist, I'm sorry, excuse me, archaeologist, not an architect, uh, who uh, was doing research on this ancient, ancient village or city. He called it a Neolithic city. Archaeologists thought this was the classic oxymoron. You can't have a Neolithic city. The Neolithic was the age of agriculture. And we had to have agriculture in order to have cities. So you couldn't have a Neolithic city. Uh, a, a city of what? Hunters and gatherers? And, she, and, and, and eventually what, what uh, Jane Jacobs would say is indeed yes. Hunters and gatherers formed the first urban settlements. They moved from bands of 120, 150 people uh, into settlements of 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. And in the evidence of southern Turkey at Çatalhöyük, uh, possibly 12,000 people, my goodness. And that agriculture, the full-scale agricultural revolution went hand in hand with cities and urbanization. That cities, remember that without cities we'd all be poor, 
cities experiment, try new ways. There's a concentration of need. Uh, the first concentrations were probably primarily for trade purposes, to ease and make trade more efficient because trade was essential in the Stone Age, particularly uh, the trade in uh, hard stones such as obsidian and flint and so on. Uh, and it's easier to distribute uh, stone tools, uh, a batch of them to a concentrated population, than to go around to these tents of nomadic hunters and gatherers and give them each what they need. Uh, but once you started getting people gathering together by the thousands, uh, the collection and hunting, uh, food uh, and shelter provisioning, uh, was not going to work very effectively for these larger concentrations of society, if you wish. Uh, and uh, what we had then is an expansion of agriculture. People came into these cities, they probably knew that if you planted these seeds, you would get a crop and you could tend them and get stuff. But you could go, go out and gather the wild seeds just as easily. Uh, but once you start settling in cities, agriculture became much more essential to develop in a, in a much more extended way. And so she was arguing in putting cities first that cities were the foundation of agriculture. She turned anthropological and prehistorical rigid canonical tradition on its head. Everyone, everyone has accepted. You've been all taught this if you ever were taught anything about this at all. And it still dominates all the textbooks that you had to have an agricultural surplus in order for cities to form. Uh, and she was saying nonsense it's the other way around. In order to have an agricultural surplus, you have to have cities. That urbanization is the driving force for creating an agricultural surplus. They thought she was crazy. There's new evidence being built in Chatalhuyuk uh, today with a, an extraordinary dig that has a fantastic online page for you, you would all enjoy. Um, because here's the first true architecture, built form, originates in these early cities with our greatest knowledge being Chatalhuyuk. Jericho is another site uh, with more fame, fame to it, but uh, uh, Chatalhuyuk may have been bigger and more generative. It was the cultural creative center. Breakthroughs in Western art that are unheard of, recognized in almost every art history book uh, by a particular wall painting. That's here. This is 8,500 years old. And I know all of you people who know the history of perspective and how it originates in Renaissance and all of that stuff. Here's a kind of bird's eye view 8,500 years ago. Uh, footprints of an urban settlement located near a volcano erupting slightly and producing obsidian that was the vital technology tool uh, for this population. Uh, an extraordinary fresco uh, that was produced in the beautifully in designed housing of the area. By the way, these uh, houses uh, in, uh, the, uh, in Chatalhuyuk were permanent uh, buildings. They weren't sort of simple round huts. Uh, they were concrete. They were plastered intensely. They were decorated extraordinarily inside. Uh, they uh, had no shared walls, all right? No shared walls at all. So each household was an independent unit that could be lived in by two, three generations. And then everyone is buried inside because we have the origins of extended religious beliefs also being associated with these early cities. They were producing society and culture. Uh, and uh, what would happen is you just tear down the building and build another one on top of it. So you have these layers and layers and layers of individual families, in a sense, lineages, uh, going down in particular locations, uh, many, many layers uh, down uh, historically. 
so this was an ex this wall painting is one of the creativity creative acts. Uh, this is the first painting of the cooked, in the, with respect to the raw and the cooked. Almost all art before then was either maybe some geometric designs or pictures of hunting scenes, of animals and of nature and of whatever. Here we have a painting of socially constructed space, the first urban settlement, uh, and all kinds of other things. The first metallurgy chat that we know of, right? Chatal huyuk. The first textiles, rugs, chatal huyuk. Uh, the breakthrough in art, uh, extraordinary works of sculpture, including women. Uh, the contemporary goddess cult recognizes chatal huyuk as its central major uh, development center. They were slightly earlier. Uh, examples of it, but in Chatal Huyuk this art form took off in part because of symbolic symbolism of fertility uh, in women uh, and the connection to uh, agriculture where uh, you had to depend upon uh, a beneficent nature uh, for uh, survival. Uh, and so hence uh, origins of all kinds of things associated with this. So this is uh, uh, a, a reconstruction of the painting, uh, actually by the archaeologist's wife in, in uh, the, the, the uh, 60s. Uh, this is the remnants of uh, one of the walls. Uh, this was the painting on the wall. Uh, you can just barely make it out. Uh, this pieces of this are now in the uh, Museum uh, of uh, uh, Anatolian Civilization in Ankara, uh, misplaced, by the way. Uh, that's another story. Uh, and here's a, a nice map uh, with the location of Chatal Huyuk uh, prominently displayed. This whole belt was a belt of urbanization extending from southern Anatolia into northern Syria, northern Iraq, uh, and into contemporary Iran. Uh, this whole, whole belt over here uh, going across. Uh, much of this area, uh, major finds being destroyed uh, both by governments building dams and by the Iraq war. Okay, I'll, I'll spend relatively little on this. Book five is uh, respatializing Aristotle because the term I, I, I used for uh, the power of urban spatial causality uh, was cynicism taken from the Greek term cynicismos. Uh, which got translated and used occasionally by obscure historians, uh, but rarely used in the English language, uh, uh, particularly in American English. I've never seen it. It was originally spelled with uh, S-Y-N-O-E-C-I-S-M, pronounced cynicism, and I decided to put the K back from the Greek uh, to avoid the, the uh, obvious mispronunciation and misunderstanding of the term. Uh, and cynicism uh, is talked about as central to uh, what Aristotle wrote about politics. Cynicism was the coming together of uh, communities to form a metropolis, a mother metropolis, a, a, a centralized uh, urban sphere of life uh, that uh, people gathered together around uh, a particular center. And it was this, of course, that gave rise to uh, all of our visions of the concept of polis, which of course is still alive today, and charters of Athens are particularly in, in, in architectural theory and history, which, oh, by the way, always should be theory, geog theory space, and you know, geography and history, but never is. It's always history, crit 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 history theory, and criticism. Uh, space has to be in there explicitly, but it's not, but that's my usual cry and plug for, for an architectural audience. Uh, but uh, what I was linking was this notion of cynicism, the generative force of cities, why we're putting cities first, uh, and indeed this notion of politics. Uh, there's some exciting writings today, based on Aristotle in part, but not only on Aristotle, making the argument that being political, all politics, has to do with being urban. And it has been true. We can't speak about democracy without talking about the city uh, and the city-state. And the other thing 
that comes from Aristotle uh, is uh, the third term in his arguments about forms of knowledge. Uh, we're familiar with the first two he uses, episteme, for epistemology and for scientific forms of knowledge. Techni, for technology, technical knowledge, method, metho met uh, methodological knowledge. And the third term, much less used, of phronesis, uh, which he talked about as a kind of wisdom and practical knowledge derived from experience and primarily designed to deal with urban life, managing thousands and thousands of people living together in a, uh, a urban agglomeration. Uh, another book that will take us not just into digging the past, uh, but into a large number of contemporary debates that uh, phronesis rather than techni and episteme should have been the center of social theory and the social sciences, uh, but was not, uh, and is certainly central to all city building activities. Okay, uh, I talk about the first urban revolution being this one that was associated with agriculture, the invention and expansion of agrarian societies. Uh, this is 6,000 years before the uh, place where most texts talk about the origins of cities, which is in ancient Sumeria, in the Tigris-Euphrates, Mesopotamia, all of that story, Ur and uh, Babylon and all kinds of uh, examples there. Uh, and I would argue that that was indeed another urban revolution. It was a revolution that created not the city, but the city-state. The polis should be city-state. Uh, and it was a political revolution, creating the city. And I also argue, uh, creating class structures, cl creating bureaucracy, creating monarchies and uh, royal uh, groups, uh, creating empire, creating patriarchy. Because the evidence is the first cities were extraordinarily egalitarian by gender and by other measures. Um, and uh, suddenly the next kind of city that emerges uh, 6,000 or so years later uh, is highly hierarchical and centralized uh, and increasingly, not right from the beginning, but increasingly male-dominated. Uh, interesting story. But then uh, I jump to a third urban revolution where another kind of city emerges uh, and I associate this with the, in bold letters, the urban-generated industrial revolution. Uh, uh, a point of view that uh, is contrary to all the literature. That is, the industrialization came from cities. Cities were necessary for the industrial revolution to take place, just as cities were necessary for the agricultural revolution to take place and other major changes in the history of human society. Uh, and the, uh, the, the historians laughed. They said, soldier, what the hell are you talking about? You know that the first factories were on rapids along rivers with little mills taking the little bits of electricity to, to, uh, or the force of the river to turn the mills and so on. These were the beginnings of the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution. These were not uh, cities. These were not happening in cities. But the argument again is for in order for a full-scale industrial society, industrial capitalism, to exist, we had to have the formations of Manchester's and Liverpool's, uh, the industrial capitalist city, Chicago's and St. Louis's, for the full-scale industrial revolution to take place. Because what was happening was this convergence of the urbanization process of the past 12,000, 10,000, whatever year, 11,000 years, uh, the industrialization process and capitalist development, all coming together uh, in the city. And we can spend some more time, but I'll, I'll move ahead, uh, that uh, we can sort of trace this in a series of changes over the last 200 years. Uh, we've seen uh, not the transformation of this third kind of city, but uh, a kind of restructuring process. And most of my work recently has been in trying to understand the latest period of intensive restructuring, which has been happening over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, almost a, a, a basic premise in everything I do is that the last 20 or 30 years has, has been uh, a period of extraordinary urban transformation uh, or urban 
structural reconfiguration, almost to the point, as some architects and uh, other writers say, uh, creating a, a new kind of city that uh, marks the end of the industrial city. But I think it's still the industrial city, uh, but in a radical new form, and hence the, the term that I use is post-metropolis and post-metropolitan. Uh, that the traditional metropolis as we knew it that was characterized sometimes, no, not so much by Los Angeles, but by Chicago and, and other cities in the post-war period, although Los Angeles was also exemplifying it too, uh, the modern metropolis, which became quite dominant in the early part of the 20th century and was the dominant large-scale urban form. By the modern metropolis, I mean uh, something where you can tell the difference between uh, what is urban, that there's one urban core, uh, and it's surrounded by various suburban rings. There was urbanism as a way of life and suburbanism as a way of life. And all of our libraries are filled with urban studies that recognize these two different worlds. Urban is excitement and density and, and crime and drugs and juvenile delinquency and museums and art galleries and thrills and so on and so on. Wonderful things that are urban and part of urbia. Suburbia is uh, ticky-tacky houses and, and, and homogeneous white, uh, lily-white populations increasingly. Uh, nothing much exciting. Dormitory communities uh, with uh, usually one breadwinner coming in and women trapped with conveniences and appliances in their suburban homes, highly educated but uh, not in the workforce, rearing children with major uh, work of, of reproduction in the household, uh, but unpaid. Uh, that, that, all of those stories. What's been happening in the last 30 years is messing that whole thing up. Uh, n nowhere more so than uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm not sure if this is... Uh, oh, and I'll, I'll do that later on. Uh, but uh, th that this is sort of creating the, the dynamics of what's tr happening today. What's his name? Duanis. We're not living in suburban America anymore. Suburbia is not what it was before. We're seeing an extraordinary transformation, including, in part, an urbanization of suburbia. It's a contradiction in terms, yes, but that's exactly what's happening. Huh? Uh, that we're seeing suburbia differentiated, and we have in front of us, nearby, one of the, the oldest and best models of this process over there in Orange County. Orange County is not suburbia. Uh, I can go on and on and on uh, about that, uh, about Orange County and punk rock and all kinds of things. Uh, but but, but uh, this is not, we, we can't tell the difference anymore between what is urban and what is suburban. All of the stuff we used to think that was associated with urban and urban cores are now associated with suburban too. Uh, and we can no longer teach and think about cities and metropolitan areas as being neatly divided between the urban and the suburban. We see outer cities, polycentric cities, networked cities, uh, a very different kind of broader metropolis, a city region, and so on. And that comes uh, a little bit to the next step here, uh, or the next book. Uh, the urbanization of the globe has been what has been happening over the third, uh, these past years, uh, 30 years. Uh, at the same time as the globalization of the urban. Uh, a, a, a dual process. In fact, I'm, I'm almost arguing that the distinctive feature of this contemporary process of globalization, which is an old process, uh, has to do with the spread of urban industrialism, of urban industrial capitalism over every square inch of the Earth's surface. The Amazon, Antarctica, the Siberian taiga is urbanized. They're not cities, but they are shaped by what is being generated from cities. The ocean is probably best seen as urbanized, uh, as having a thin, thin urban fabric connecting it to the major large cities of the world, the new emerging city regions. Here's putting cities first in understanding globalization that the whole world is being urbanized, every city is global, every settlement is global, every hamlet is globalized to some degree. 
Um, the the uh, rise of, as I say, mega city regions, it's not just this one statistic that more than 50% live in cities, but if we start d defining things as city regions on a larger scale and then start connecting city regions to nearby city regions in terms of continuous urbanized zones, we're getting 50, 60, 75 percent, 85 percent, well, not 85 percent, but 65, 75 percent of the world's population living in these urbanized regions, and most of the rest are also connected uh, in one way to urban structures around the world. Uh, I have some maps. They're so pretty. That, that I love these maps. These are produced by people at LSE. Uh, so I'll give them a, a plug. This is uh, a map of the world at night. Uh, and you can sort of see the major densely urbanized areas of the world from their lights. Right? Uh, you can see the pinpointed lights in various places. Yeah, pretty bright in Southern California and so on and so forth. Uh, very bright all over uh, uh, Japan uh, and in much of China, into some bits of Siberia too. Uh, and uh, this has been a process that's been going on for a long time and we have a lovely sequence of maps. This is the f million, the, the cities of the world of more than a million. 1825, London alone. 1850, London, Paris, Beijing. 1875, New York is added, what is it, probably Berlin, Vienna. Uh, Beijing drops out, whether that's data problems, I don't know. But uh, 1900, suddenly, suddenly so something starts happening. Uh, Calcutta and Bombay and Sydney and uh, Buenos Aires and, and, and uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, 1950, they multiply even further. By the way, the large dots are the emergence of 10 million plus cities. Uh, starting to happen in 1950, we see a bunch of them uh, developing 10 million plus. 1975, this is the last 30 or 40 years, and 2000. These are now the, the UN counts the number of million plus city regions and publishes them. It's a great fun list. 438 at last count, I think, uh, and, and rising and increasing. And you can see the number of 10 million plus cities also multiplying rapidly. Okay, so this is part of the urbanization of the globe. Here was also a little an interesting little map uh, about uh, recent uh, growth per hour. In every hour, Lagos grows by 53 people. Uh, and uh, Eastern American cities and European cities are declining by three to five uh, every hour. Uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh goes up 67 every hour, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Los Angeles is showing up with a 20 plus. That's pretty, no, pretty significant. Uh, much more than Tokyo, almost like Manila, more than Bangkok, etc. Uh, okay, now. I've already sort of come up to book eight, which has to do with new regionalism. I, when I lecture to architects, I often uh, lecture on regional thinking, uh, because I think this is one of the best ways to get uh, architects to understand the nature of uh, the importance of regional thinking. The new regionalism is working in between the global and the local, the macro and the, mac and the micro, at a, what's called a mesogeographical scale. All right? hence this term mesogeographies, uh, and also this notion of scale. And this funny word that's sort of ugly sounding, but is actually quite useful, glocalization, so that we don't simply think of the world as being global and local, and that's it. You know, think global, act local. Uh, but the regional approach makes us, rep you know, makes us understand the multiple layers that exist from the body to the building to the cluster of buildings to what the architects then think of as the cluster of cluster of buildings. That, by the way, is often equal to city. Right? The cluster of clusters of buildings. Uh, space syntax does that. Uh, and and uh, then beyond that, there's the world. Right? We are uh, out of space in physical space. But this space is contextualized, situated, located 
within a multiplicity of scales, a multiplicity uh, of nodal regions. Uh, and that these regions are driving forces of development, these city regions. Uh, this is the new, new word that is settling in and coming largely from Los Angeles scholars. Uh, Los Angeles scholars have been participating in almost all of these things, uh, not just me, uh, um, in, in uh, doing some uh, very interesting work uh, on all of these concepts. And it relates to the fact that these changes are taking place without our governance structures taking place, changing. Uh, Los Angeles taking it as an example. Los Angeles has changed over the last 30 or 40 years as much, if not more, than almost any other major city region in the world. Uh, I presume all of you are now beginning to be aware of this startling fact that even startled me, that in 1990, Los Angeles passed New York as the densest urbanized area in America. The densest urbanized area in America is Los Angeles. Right? What if we measure sprawl by density, which is the way we used to talk about sprawl? Does that mean Los Angeles is the most compact city in the United States? The least sprawl? Obviously, the problem has to do with our concept of sprawl, because that's changed, uh, or, m or should change. But what I'm saying is this extraordinary regional urbanization process, as I call it, has supplanted the normal urbanization plus suburbanization process. We're seeing a regional urbanization process around the world, filling in the metropolitan boundaries. Over the last 30 years, contrary to all kinds of myths, Los Angeles hasn't eaten up a lot of new uh, old agricultural spaces. It hasn't really eaten up outer desert areas. It's densified. I used to go to conferences largely with architects talking about, you know, should we densify the city or not? And this is big in London too amongst <coughs> architects. Density is the solution. Uh, you know, but the city is densifying already on its own. It has densified more rapidly than any other place. In 1960, Los Angeles was indeed the image, the least dense major metropolis in the United States. Right? Uh, today, it's the densest. This expresses itself not just in gridlock and other worries, but in probably the greatest housing crisis almost anywhere. Because these millions and millions of the immigrant working poor have come into a low-flung, low-rise environment and packed into the housing, uh, creating some of the worst problems of homelessness, housing overcrowding, housing inadequacy, uh, unaffordability in, in rental and purchase, uh, the worst multidimensional housing crisis around. Uh, and we architects and planners are playing around with, with uh, other kinds of uh, issues uh, and forgetting about this. Uh, part of this also relates to, as I say, a governance challenge uh, and dealing with the fact that the other discovery, in, ad in addition to cynicism, is not just that cities generate wealth and creativity and lots of good things, but cities also generate inequality, hierarchy, domination, subordination and that the last 30 years have seen the greatest increase in inequality the United States has ever experienced. That right now, the, the difference between the concentration of wealth in the super rich 1% or 5% of the population and the poor 40% of the population has never been greater in American history. The transformation, what I call the post-metropolitan transformation, has been associated with these extraordinarily deepening, intensified inequalities. The last two, uh, uh, much of the economics research, I would like to develop, expand, and get more than economists who are going to be very boring uh, in dealing with these exciting issues and get more people involved in studying this urban spatial causality uh, and to go beyond, you know, the, I don't know how hot this is uh, in architectural circles, but uh, it's hot in certain planning circles, not in my planning department, but. Uh, here at UCLA, but uh, elsewhere, the notion of creative cities, Richard Florida's work, uh, he's sort of picking up a little bit about this and marketing it, right? Just like years ago, Garo, the journalist, marketed the concept of edge city and became very well known for this notion. Now the idea of, the new ideas of putting cities first uh, on creativity are being picked up uh, and uh, he's become very well known. Uh, 
uh, for his work on the creative class in creative cities. He did big sociological statistical analysis and he discovered the highest correlation. His measure of creativity was number of patents uh, generated in different cities around the country. Uh, and he did some statistical analysis and he found the highest correlation was with bohemian indexes. Right? Uh, the, law, the size of the bohemian population and the highest statistical correlation had to do with the gay population. So the argument is to pr produce a creative city you should hire a gay pop, a gay, increase the gay population if you simplistically follow the creative cities kind of argument. And Florida is being given th th thousands and thousands of dollars to consult. The latest is in Singapore uh, you probably all know about the new experiments, Zaha Hadid and others working in Singapore, uh, partly because Singapore is now trying to become a cultural city. It's done all of this other stuff uh, that we've written about, uh, social controlled uh, uh, political economy and so on. Uh, and now it wants to get culture because culture industries are hot and so it's trying to create operas and art centers and galleries and hiring star architects to to sort of come in and do things there. And they've hired Florida. You know, how can we make Singapore a cultural capital? And I'm not sure, I have this vision that they're gonna have a container of gay people being shipped to Singapore as part of this, this process. Uh, by the way, the statistic does not include lesbians. Uh, the correlation with the lesbian population is nowhere near as high as the correlation with the gay population. I don't know what that tells us. Uh, but uh, this is part of the statistical line. I think we all need to participate in this. Uh, and not to let some of these uh, people get away with what they're getting away with. Uh, and a part of this is to sort of uh, uh, re get this concept of spatial capital uh, conceptualized. Nobody has quite used that term uh, yet, um, although uh, everything clearly gets rooted back in Jane Jacobs. Nobel Prize winning economists, as well as Richard Florida, have said that Jane Jacobs should have won the Nobel Prize for her discovery in 1969 of what now the economists are calling Jane Jacobs externalities in economics texts. This, they are arguing, urbanization through human capital causes all economic development. The economists have accepted this now and they're going on and doing more in econometric modeling and so on. Uh, we, 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 we can't just let the economists run with this concept. Uh, we need to join in with this. Uh, and uh, I, I talk about this in terms of dis discovering spatial capital. The last one, also part of the spatial turn, that we must spatialize capital and put cities first, put urban spatial causality first. Uh, and this last book is something I've been writing and hope to finish. This is the one book I think will be th come the one first finished uh, on seeking spatial justice. Uh, and it's particularly uh, focused on Los Angeles. Uh, and it's making the same kind of argument that we must see this, rethink the concept of justice from an urban spatial perspective. That justice and injustice are generated through, in part, not entirely 100%, through urban spatial causality. We produce you, architects, all city builders, planners, people who are shaping the city, uh, are contributing to the production of what could potentially turn out to be unjust spaces, unjust geographies. Uh, the new kind of spatial consciousness that I'm talking about recognizes city space as a social product. Right? Uh, when you put your pen to design, I'm not saying you have to think about all of these complexities, but they should not be completely dismissed. You may be contributing to gender uh, reinforcement of masculinist domination or whatever, or to racist exclusion and segregation when you're designing uh, buildings in particular in the city, and particularly urban design. Uh, that that uh, we have to see the city is a generative force of all kinds of things, good things, bad things. It's creating injustices uh, on a particularly a regional scale. So uh, I see regional democracy and spatial justice uh, as, as interwoven. Uh, and I see this 
uh, as a form of political strategy, a politics of urban, new politics of urban space emerging uh, as potentially one of the most important forces of positive change in the future. And the place where everything has been happening most rapidly and intensely is Los Angeles, and it's not surprising that Los Angeles has been the particular place where quite innovative struggles for spatial, explicitly spatial justice uh, have been sparked. Uh, they're not huge. Uh, they, uh, I give them a lot of attention. I'm not saying that, that they revolutionized the world, but they may be the, one of the few sparks of hope uh, in the contemporary world. Uh, organizing coalitions to change the geography, to recognize that the geography of all kinds of things that we've produced in Los Angeles has negative effects on certain populations. The best example, and I'll just close with it, is the Bus Riders Union uh, in Los Angeles. After a 1996 court case, I don't know how much of you know this, an extraordinary thing happened. Uh, the uh, 75,000 are supposedly transit independent uh, the transit dependent people, the immigrant working poor of central Los Angeles, this agglomeration, the biggest in the world uh, of the immigrant working poor in, in central Los Angeles. That's partly why density has increased so rapidly. We've got Manhattan densities in Alvarado and parts of Los Angeles now. Uh, and uh, out of this are coming some interesting ideas and they protested against the Metropolitan Transit Authority uh, and their plans for fixed rail. Their plans for fixed rail were sort of traditional spokes in a wheel going out from the center of Los Angeles, even though everybody knows the center of Los Angeles is not that big. Why should it look like as if it was Chicago with spokes coming out from, from the loop? Uh, and uh, they protested that this was a discriminatory transit network with regard to the needs of the poor, of the immigrant working poor. They needed flexible transit networks. They were multi-job households, they were multi-locational jobs where they would move in different places at different times of the week and so on. Uh, they didn't need a fixed rail that went from the city center to the suburb. They needed something like bus transit uh, in particular. They couldn't afford cars, that's why they were called transit independent. And so they made their argument on that basis saying that the proposed plans for fixed rail were racially discriminatory, a civil rights case. Uh, they favored the richer white population uh, against the minority populations of the city, even though the minorities are now the majority. Uh, and uh, also, in addition to being r racially discriminatory, uh, discriminatory uh, they also called it spatially unjust, geographically unjust, geographically discriminatory. Discriminating on the basis of one's location in the city. That people concentrated in the center, such as the immigrant working poor, were discriminated against by a, tra a transit system, a rail system, that was going to favor suburban, sprawled out white populations, already wealthy. And they won the case and partly contributed to a closure, a stopping of any new rail construction. The rest of the story gets more and more complicated. But the successful court case, which by the way, opened up the possibility of precedents that would transform American cities forever if it could be followed up. That is every plan in a city for housing, uh, not just for transit, for health, for education, could be challenged in the courts based upon its geographical discriminations, like environmental justice has been focusing on. Right? You get discriminated against by your location, and this is unjust and illegal. So potentially all plans for the city could be challenged for every city in the country. Uh, if it weren't for the Iraq war, this would have been one of the number one targets of the Bush regime. Uh, they took a little while. Uh, how they crippled it eventually, uh, it was fought against by everybody in Los Angeles, and lots of the power structure in Los Angeles. And, you know, indeed, some of the arguments were that the fixed rail did have some advantages for the poor, 
uh, and maybe there should be some rail construction uh, continued. Uh, these are very reasonable arguments, but uh, the, the Bus Riders Union uh, was able to reject them, and they were be, being given court support. Uh, but uh, the way it was crushed was uh, to uh, by, by cases uh, as they were brought up intentionally, uh, and, demonstra and the argument was imposed that you had to prove intention. You had to prove the planners got together and they said, let's discriminate against the poor. Right? Uh, and of course, if that's what's going to have to happen, uh, the teeth of everything uh, was, uh, were destroyed. Uh, and so, oh, but, but I think there's a, a precedent set in terms of understanding the dynamics of the contemporary city that we need to sort of simulate these labor, community, university connected faith-based, you know, ethnic, cultural, peace, environmentalist coalitions uh, to struggle for uh, increasing spatial justice or for the weakening of spatial injustices at multiple scales. In a way, we can talk about it even on a global scale. Uh, the, the uneven development of the world is geographically unjust. We don't have an international court that we could bring this to on the same level, uh, but I'm saying down to the micro scale, uh, and maybe even into the household, uh, into uh, not just gender, but individual differences within the household, in terms of how even micro spaces are organized. Uh, I'm not saying this is a, a, as serious a problem as these other inequalities and injustices in society, but it's at least representative of this larger regional spatial perspective. And that's the last slide. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 